Welcome this afternoon to the Wallace Foundation Live Television uh, webcast. And today, one of the uh, focal points um, throughout education is on improving school leadership. And in a recent survey, actually around 2010, when polled nationally um, about the factors that would most improve or have the greatest impact um, on school success, um, second to teacher quality, um, school administrators, school leaders, principal came in second as the leading um, factor in leading all schools to high levels of achievement. And so today, we are proud to, um, because of the support of the Wallace Foundation, be able to take some time to talk to, learn from um, current school principals who are actually moving their schools, who are leading for high levels of achievement, and who actually reflect the very principles that a Wallace, uh, Wallace Commission study showed um, are key elements in leaders, school leaders that are moving their schools. And so among those, um, first is leaders' ability to shape an academic vision, a vision for success that they're able to communicate, they're able to live. Second is really creating a climate um, that is hospitable, um, both for the educators as well as families and children. Um, third is the ability to cultivate leadership in others. These are not just um, leaders who are fixated on their own leadership, but they are really focused on developing others in their school communities as leaders. Uh, fourth, and no surprise to anyone, they have very high standards and a very laser focus on improving instruction, the quality of what young people are experiencing in classrooms every day. And then finally, a really managing people and data, what I often call the behind the scenes work that people don't see, but that really is crucial um, if we want all schools performing at high levels of a success. And so a decade of this work um, and, and Wallace's support of this work led to the creation um, of principal pipeline districts where these were districts that really focused and committed to saying, not only do we understand the role of high quality leadership, but we want to be able to foster and prepare and support more leaders to be um, successful in the ways that these leaders are. So today, we are thrilled to be able to spend some time with four leaders who really are getting it done, who really are not only exemplifying these qualities, but it is bearing out in the real lives of the students and families that they are serving. So I just want to say welcome to all of you. And uh, we're going to get started. We're going to start with Danielle Moore. Um, and I want to introduce Danielle. She is uh, the principal of Gwen Park middle school and when I asked Danielle earlier I said you know can you describe to me your leadership style Danielle within the first three seconds said transformative right she's a transformative leader so without further ado um, could you talk to us a little bit Danielle about how you shape the vision for success um, at Gwen Park Middle um, so one of the things that we really do to shape the vision is try to build a culture of collaboration because prior to anyone being able to um, execute a vision, there has to be some feeling of being connected to the people that you are serving. So teachers that come into the building have to feel a sense of responsibility to the students that they serve. Um, many years as principals, we come in, and then you have new staff members. It could be each year you have new staff, whatever the turnover rate may be. So you have to work on building that culture of collaboration. So what I've done, is spent my first year as principal really building that culture of collaboration um, within my building. And I found myself being really intentional about the strategies, activities, and things that I engaged my uh, teachers in, as well as the leadership team, with regards to the school and the expectations in order to make the vision happen. Because after all, I mean, the vision is something on paper, it's words that you'll see posted around the building. However, it's the actions that follow behind the vision, which is really important. Uh, so I spent a lot of time building that culture of collaboration in the beginning of my tenure there. And then through that, 
the teachers were able to hear and understand the expectations that were set uh, with regards to me as well as our leadership team. Um, and then I felt that there were some ways that we had to come up with some non-negotiables. So our vision spoke to some non-negotiables, which were that all students were here to learn and we were here to serve all students. Um, and then we kept reiterating that the first year. And it takes a little bit of time for people to understand that that is a non-negotiable for you. And so in meetings and things that we've done throughout the school year, we had to keep coming back to that. And after we go back to it enough, it begins to become people's way of thinking. Um, and then that began to really transform what we did in our building. Um, and we were able to begin to continuously shape the vision of our school because we had buy-in, everyone was on the same playing field, and we all had the same level of expectations. And that does take quite a while to do. And I think we, I spent my first year um, just really establishing that culture in order to build upon shaping um, the vision of that particular school. Great. That's very helpful, Danielle. Um, now we're going to turn to this end, and it is my pleasure to also introduce um, Eddie Maresh, who is a, the, also a middle school principal in Gwinnett County Schools in Georgia. Um, Eddie, your school has 2,200 uh, students and a very diverse population. Um, and you have talked about striving to have a world-class education for all of your young people. Um, very similar to Danielle, could you just share with us a little bit about how you have approached this idea of creating um, an environment where all young people, uh, regardless of where they come from, um, are expected and supported to achieve at high levels? Talk sure. a bit about that. Well, going into uh, Creekland Middle School, uh, the first you know, steps were to figure out what, what is the vision because, um, you know, our superintendent says, you know, sometimes you want to go in slowly and don't move the garbage cans, figure out what needs to change and that kind of thing. But uh, going into Creekland Middle School, when it opened in 1996, it had an identity of being this really large school and it was known for that and it had procedures and processes and it had a school within a school concept that allowed it to, to be a very high performing school. But over time, uh, as the demographics changed, uh, it became more diverse, uh, more poor, uh, the needs changed. And so when I got there and, and I asked, you know, what is our vision? Uh, the challenge was there, there really wasn't a published vision. There was a mission statement, um, but there wasn't a clear vision. So what I found was that they were hungry to have a clear direction and a sense of you know, where we are as a school now and where do we want to go. So a part of that process was developing that vision. So I was able to go through that process in my very first year as principal at Creekland Middle School is to develop the vision. And so to, to create a vision that was aligned with our system vision of being a system of world-class schools, uh, that became our vision was to, to be a world-class school. And, and so that sounds great. It sounds like a cliche. It sounds like a, you know, a motto for a car commercial. But how do you make it more real? How do you make it concrete? So as Danielle said, how do you get it off the wall and into the halls uh, where uh, we're, we're you know, working each day in and out for students. Um, and so what's important at that point is once you create the, the vision is to, to let people know what their connection is to the vision. How do they contribute uh, to the vision? So for example, world-class organizations such as Chick-fil-A, if you work there, you know your contribution is to say, my pleasure, uh, to smile, uh, to put the pickles right in the middle, and that kind of thing. Well, as a teacher at Creekland Middle School, what is your role? How do you contribute to the vision? As the front office staff, how do you contribute to that vision? So it's making sure everybody knows what their clear role is uh, in contributing to that. And so that gives them buy-in and ownership, uh, and it, it makes it compelling for them to be a part of that. Uh, and then, as Danielle talked about, it's just it's that consistency, sticking with it. Uh, sometimes you have that new uh, experience going into a school, but then maintaining uh, the focus because you can get very distracted by all the things that are happening out there. Uh, how do you maintain the focus on the vision and revisit it frequently? An important part of that is celebrate. When you have those victories and, and you have successes, it's to celebrate. Yeah, and it's very interesting because you, you noted this idea of focus, right, and mm -hmm. helping people to stay focused. And it's very um, interesting. It's related, Cesar, to something um, that I think is part of your work. And um, so it's my pleasure, by the way, to introduce uh, Cesar Cedillo. And he is a high school principal in Denver Public Schools with a program that actually spans grades 6 through 12. Um, and 
uh, Cesar and his team have actually been recognized by President Obama uh, for being a school with high levels of improvement and again picking up um, on something that Eddie just talked about in terms of focus. Can you talk to us a little bit about as principal of a high, highly improving, high performing school, um, how do you help your team stay focused on this vision of a high academic rigor um, for all young people? Yeah, um, so, you know, Bruce Randolph is the fifth highest impacted school in Colorado, um, comprehensive school, so meaning numbers of free and reduced lunch students, uh, minority students, high numbers of English language learners, mm -hmm. uh, students with IEPs and mobility, and yet we're a 90-90 school, meaning 98% free and reduced lunch, 98% students of color, 98% graduation rate. And I think the way we've attacked this is the, the, the rigor piece is really looking at structural rigor. Does your school have structural rigor? Does your master calendar, if you see it, does it show structural rigor? And for us, that's one of the, um, the questions we asked and implemented. So for example, our teachers have daily collaborative content-based um, planning time. Uh, we're in there as administrators with them. I am in charge of the science team and with the teacher leader, and we co-facilitate that work. And what it does is it really aligns our 6th through 12th grade as far as the data on Mondays, the, you know, the PD on Tuesdays, the extensions of PD. And then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we really look at um, lesson planning and ensure that we're um, super aligned um, to the school's initiative. Um, I think what it does also, um, our master calendar allows us then to, the structural rigor in our master calendar has a uh, college seminar course for our high school students. Uh, almost 100% of our students are first generation students. So they don't know how to do college right. and how to uh, sift through the, the many ways to get there. And so our freshmen are taking college level courses um, in the college seminar class. And um, uh, they do uh, keyboarding and then the next year they take the, the next level and then by junior year they're really looking at um, test prep or on the ECT and then by senior year really that's the time and place where they apply to college 100% uh, have been already accepted then now they're um, um, required to go into four year four to apply to four scholarships um, and we also have about 40% of our students who are undocumented. So, and that's very dear and true to my heart because I came in as an undocumented student. And so uh, we work with, our, with DACA around um, that work. And I think for us is really looking at um, putting those structures in place in order to drive that improvement. And you know, things like graduation um, rates have improved and so has our remediation rate. It used to be in the 80s and within one year, 80% didn't need remediation. And um, I think lastly for me is, you know, one of the things that I tell my teachers um, around rigor is we, if we can all, and they all agree that we want, our mission is to break the cycle of poverty, everybody can get on board with that. Mm -hmm. That's great. That is really great. And, it, and it's really nice being able to hear, particularly at the high school level, what dramatic improvement looks like. Um, as a former um, founder of a, of a K through eight school, I think what's really interesting is that on this panel today, we have examples both at the high school level as well as now, uh, Gina, at the, at the uh, lower grade level. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Gina O'Hare. And Gina is a, the principal of a K-5 elementary school um, in Charlotte Mecklenburg. And Gina has taken, um, her, her school, or took her previous school, mm -hmm. from being one of the lowest performing schools um, in North Carolina to, um, to basically being recognized as a high growth status school. So again, what's really nice is we have an example at the high school. Gina, tell us a little bit um, about um, your journey and how are you able to get those results from going from one of the lowest performing to then being recognized for, for high growth? Well, when a principal gets assigned a school, um, it's kind of like Forrest Gump's box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And um, I got a lot when I opened up that box of chocolates. Um, I'll say that I really needed to focus on three areas when I got to the turnaround school. And the first one was I realized rather quickly that the staff was behind on different initiatives that were already in place. One being the professional learning communities. So they were planning in isolation, they weren't planning together, and what they were planning um, was not aligned to the North Carolina Standard Course of Study or Common Core at the time. And they would basically just go through the textbook. So the first thing we did was go ahead and em embed PLCs and model for them how to do that and weekly. 
And so that was first and foremost, making sure that what we were planning and teaching was aligned. The next thing I did was work with professional development in two areas. The first area had to do with data-driven instruction, so making sure that what we taught was assessed and also looking at what to do after testing. I had found that going in, they would give it a quiz, they would record the results in a tracker, but then do nothing with it. There was no follow-up. So we certainly had to put in place there how to build quality common assessments and then what to do after we gave it. So build in a reteach cycle mm -hmm. or enrichment. The last thing that I worked on to help move the school was really training staff on working with students who are in high poverty and what their needs were because I found that a lot of the teachers did not have the skill set to deal with the social and emotional issues that were happening. It was very common for me when I first got there to walk into a classroom and um, a child have an outburst of, you know, desks being thrown over or, you know, running around the room and the teacher just acted like that was normal. Mm. Um, just ignored the behavior yeah. or did not know how to deal with it. So we quickly did professional development on, you know, the effects of poverty and how we could build relationships and kind of problem solve and, and work out those issues. And working in those three areas really gave us um, huge amounts of gains and growth and we got moved off one of the lowest 10 performing schools in North Carolina. Well, that's wonderful. And, and it's very interesting, Jeannie, because you continued a theme that I heard um, amongst all of you, which says a lot because you're all high-performing leaders. And it is this theme of investing in others. And so one of the things that um, I'd be interested in from, from any of you is to talk a little bit about how you move from that initial investment in, as you were describing, Gina, um, kind of getting people caught up and developed in um, instructional practices and different strategies of engaging students. Um, talk about how you also make that shift to developing folks to be leaders, right? Because it's, it's one thing to develop people to be more proficient in their knowledge. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach this, this idea of, of building other leaders who are also capable of leading? And you can, if you're ready. Sure, go ahead, Eddie. I think a similar start. journey to Gina, where you're uh, asking teachers to be leaders and to, to lead their curriculum teams to be collaborative and that kind of thing. And it's not something you can just put them in that position and say, go collaborate. Uh, you have to give them the tools and, and uh, the, the support to do that. And so we you know, started at Creekland the Leadership Summit in the summer, where we trained them on specific uh, strategies for, for being effective lead, you know, curriculum leaders, everything from what does an effective meeting look like? Establishing your norms, you know, what, uh, how to use the data effectively, you know, and, and those kind of things. So, uh, making sure they have the training to be successful. We identify them, but, but we need to make sure they have the support to, to be successful because it is tough when you're out there with teachers who, who give pushback sometimes, or it's new, it's different, sure. um, and so we got to make sure we set them up for success. Sure, that's great. I, so, I, agree, I agree with Eddie, and I think part of the principal role is to um, philosophically say I'm building leaders in my building mm -hmm. with my assistant principals. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that work is um, to have them be there in real authentic positions, because everybody loves the assistant principal, right? Um, but when you have a tough conversation, it's very important to teach them and not only um, how to do things, but the feeling that you get when you have to have a tough conversation with another adult. And, uh, but I think that will grow and develop them um, as stronger leaders. So, I think um, really having a philosophy that we grow our leaders as principals for to be future principals is um, very um, important to us. And it's very interesting because the combination of what you both said that, that I think does distinguish um, higher performing leaders is you talked about support and being very deliberate with the support as well as being explicit with that expectation, right? That, that you communicate to your team you know, we expect you to lead and then we provide you the support, which is, which is really great to hear. Um, another question, and this, this comes up often even in my current position um, in policy circles, and it is this question about sustained success, right? Everybody feels as if, okay, we can get a little, little bump here, a little bump there, but when you think about how you're approaching actually sustaining, right, you, you get some gains, how, how do you, or how have you been successful in helping to stay on a trajectory of success when so many folks, um, 
it almost sometimes seems like, particularly in challenging schools, you take a couple steps forward and then, it, you know, then it feels like you're taking three steps back sometimes. How are you approaching, how have you been successful in helping to sustain the growth that you've been experiencing over a period of time? Please, go ahead. Um, so I will say one of the things that's really important to sustain is to make sure things are relevant. So sometimes um, at schools, you, you implement a lot of initiatives and things that may be district-wide, but they may not be relevant to what the work is that you need in your building. So teachers know when you're just asking them to do things to just to do things. So the work has to really be relevant and to continue to revisit that relevancy and massage it to make it work for what the needs are for your building. So I think in order to sustain that, you have to really be able to have a process in place where you are continuously going back checking in, revising, and making adjustments so that what you're doing each and every day makes sense for you as well as your teachers. Um, if not, you're just spinning your wheels. Mm -hmm. That's great. I'd say Please. inspire. I think it, uh, that's a huge part of our job. So to highlight those that are getting the job done and then to motivate and inspire our teams that you know, we met this goal and we can do even better for our kids. That's so great. we have to do that a lot. You talk about Inspire. Um, it would be great if, if any of you could share a story, um, because sometimes this work of school improvement um, can be, frankly, not only challenging, some days it's demoralizing. Um, there are days where, and I'm sure no principal in this room, um, where, where you wonder whether you're actually having the impact that you want to have on behalf of kids. Can you talk a little bit, or, and, and even, like I said, share a story of how you help keep staff um, motivated, keep yourselves even um, clued in on the days where it seems like everything else is coming at you. Um, just share a story that might help um, some school leaders out there to, to kind of focus in and on how to rejuvenate themselves and or their teams. And you know, I'm good with wait time because I taught middle school, so I can wait. You have to be able to put yourself in your teacher's shoes, mm -hmm. and you have to be able to read the audience. Yeah. And so, you know, when they're feeling stressed, then it may be that what you had on the agenda at the staff meeting, you're going to scrap that, and you're going to go into something motivational and inspirational. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, we get a lot of things as principals at the district level that's, pushed our way that is expected to be implemented. And sometimes you just have to, you know, screen it and figure out, you know, what's most important and what do I need to shield or protect my teachers from. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think one of the things that, um, you know, October is when the honeymoon ends, you know, and kids are starting to push back. And, um, and you're absolutely right, Gina. When we talk about um, pushing professional development, you have to know your audience and how teachers are feeling. So, for example, um, mid-October, what we did is had a professional development slated, ready to go around rigor. And, um, but we felt like people need to be rejuvenated. They need to, you know, fill your cup is what we call it. Fill your cup PD. Mm -hmm. So instead, uh, what we did, which was very different than we've ever done, is people signed up for different activities um, during our professional development time. So I was in charge of a basketball group where about 25 people were um, playing hoops, and the student advisor talking stuff to the Spanish teacher. Uh, there was yoga. There was Zumba. Um, there was bike riding. So things like that. And I think what um, teachers said to me, it, over and over to the next days, I appreciate it. They were sore, but um, they appreciated um, the, the message that it sent, that you do care about us, and um, we're on board. And then one thing I wanted to add it is similar to that, we do celebrate. So I have my teachers celebrate one another. So each week um, on Sunday night as an administrator, we send out a weekly update just to give you an update as to what's coming up for the week with some reminders and things like that. But all during the week, we ask teachers to shout out other teachers. So they will send me an email, they'll send another administrator an email to say, I appreciated that Ms. Jones was able to come into my room and bring support to me in my time of need with regards to a certain group of students or anything. And so what I think is very important is that we celebrate 
those quick wins because in a day there can be a lot that goes on and sometimes at the end of the day you ask yourself, you know, did I make a difference today? And I think those shout outs um, that teachers give to one another as well as administrators celebrating those small successes, those quick wins make a big difference and kind of rejuvenates and keep people motivated and on that line of um, knowing that what they're doing is making a difference. But it makes a big difference to hear it from your colleague um, on a regular basis. I would say also, yes, celebrating uh, those small wins. And what we found at our faculty meetings sometimes is having the students come and talk about the wins they've had and the success they've had. And, and it helps remind our faculty that the work we're doing is, is really worth it. That's great. And the, the nice part about that is you all gave very practical tips um, that somebody could actually leave here, either watching or here, and actually go out and do. And it's always, to me, a sign of the people that are really doing the work, because you can give the specific examples where other folks talk very generally. You guys have very tangible um, ex uh, examples, which is really helpful. Um, another piece on, on kind of a, a different, kind of a counter to that, is you all serve large numbers of young people for whom, frankly, there are still those who question um, whether they are able to reach high levels of achievement, whether um, they can. And within the context of the everyday work that you do, how do you confront um, either an individual staff member? How have you worked? And you, you can give an example if it's, if it's helpful. Um, but that overwhelming kind of prevailing sense that, well, academic rigor, and you talked a little bit about this earlier, Cesar, but that the academic rigor is great, um, but when you're talking about the, quote, kinds of kids we're serving, be they low-income kids, be they um, kids of color, um, that we somehow have to lessen that. How, how have you been able to not only confront but um, shift that thinking um, and culture, which often is so pervasive um, in schools that serve the kinds of kids that, that, that you all um, have committed to, to serving? Um, I, I can start, Eddie, I know you're about to say something. Uh, so I think it comes from the principal. Uh, it really, we set the tone for uh, these tough conversations. An example I'll give is just recently we talked about our, the struggles our um, special students with IEPs are having at our school. It's about a quarter of our population, so it's a very um, high um, um, challenge at our school. And I think the framework has to be like listening from me saying, look, we're all SPED educators. Mm. We all own our students. It is not um, okay to push them off to the special education teacher. It's us planning for their needs and for their interventions and making sure their accommodations and modifications are being um, put into practice. And the special education teacher is there to support you. But, at, um, but overall, really making a, statement, a strong statement that we're all, um, they're all our kids and we're all SPED educators. So that's one of the um, examples that I can give. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Eddie, where are you going to jump one in? One activity we did at the beginning of this year is we had all of our teachers create their own personal mission and vision. Uh, and they had to talk about their beliefs about students. And I'm a firm believer that what you believe about students is probably going to happen. So if you believe they're going to do amazing things, they probably will. And if you believe they're going to be troubled, then that's probably what you're going to end up with. Uh, and, and so they really had to define their beliefs about kids. Um, but then re related to rigor, we did an activity where the administrators had kind of gathered some of the activities we'd seen in classrooms, whether it was taking notes, PowerPoint, watching a video, creating something. And teachers had to assess, okay, how would you rank that as far as rigor? Is that high level? Is that low level? And they really had to self-assess, um, take that back to their lesson plans and kind of say, okay, what am I seeing in my lesson plans? And, and where, where is my level of rigor you know, in comparison to what we're seeing across the school? Nice, nice, great. So one of the, in, in thinking through some of the examples that you all are giving from your work, if you had to identify one of the, of the five, kind of the Wallace five, right, in terms of those high impact behaviors um, from school leaders that you would number one identify, and what piece of advice would you give um, to a school leader who is really trying to implement um, that particular element? And by way of just um, reminding you all what those um, five are, um, that shared vision of academic success, that creating the climate 
that's really hospitable and supportive um, of both staff and students, cultivating leadership in others, improving instruction, and this idea of managing people and processes. So if you were going to identify one of those and you were going to give advice to a principal just entering or, or school leader that really says, I, I want to take these seriously and really try to exemplify and walk them out in my school, um, why don't you identify one and then just tell us what your advice to that school leader would be. I, can, I would say definitely for me in every school that I've been in, it's the vision, setting that okay. and letting them know that as the leader in the school, I have high expectations and that as principals, sometimes um, you can't soften the blow. You've got people who are doing the job and doing it very well and then you have some where that just may not be the right place for them. So you have to have you know, conversations with those and let them know that if you're not working up to the expectation and you're not having an impact on student achievement here or you're not positively impacting our school climate, then this is not the place for you. And you can't waffle on those expectations. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard when someone's sitting across from you crying, um, but you just give them a Kleenex and you finish it up and move on. So. Great, great. And, and for me, I would say the climate portion is very important. Um, as a middle school principal, um, lots of times when people ask, where do you work, and you say a middle school, the response is, oh, you know, there's always this thought about um, middle school students and the middle school atmosphere. Um, and so I think building that uh, climate and culture of support um, and inviting climate for the community to understand because um, some people never step foot into your building at all. So all they know about is what they hear. And most of the time what they hear outside of your building has nothing to do about the great things that are happening in the classrooms, but it's about those extra things um, that are just minimal, however, they, they take front and center for those who don't know. So I think building that climate and culture and really focusing on that, um, you get your really big wins um, of support and then you begin to see people come in to see what's going on and then um, they can see the great things that are happening mm -hmm. in their classrooms. I would, like, I would maybe give advice on cultivating leadership and um, part, not just administrative leadership. I think there's tons of untapped um, talent in the teacher pool. And um, a, lot, a lot of times um, one, doesn't, one doesn't realize that they're just waiting to get tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, can you do this for me and lead this? Um, and they'll do it. And uh, really taking advantage of the people that you do have. Um, and so being very uh, cognizant and very intentional and aware about um, who have I not reached out to to take some leadership role within uh, the school. Yeah, that's great. And, and it's, it's interesting because um, in listening to a couple of focus groups with, with teachers um, over the past couple of months, one of the things that has come out in that is that there are some teachers who, who aren't going to. Um, just come out and volunteer themselves. They actually are waiting for leaders who will identify, who will make it okay for them to step in that next level. And so that, that's a really, I think, important point. And sometimes because school leaders are so weighed down, right, with your own weight, you forget that the people that you're leading um, actually, particularly when they're high quality leaders like you all, folks who, who have already experienced success, all it takes sometimes is their principal um, who you know, takes the time to come out and say, you know, I, I actually think you would be great for that. And after having the hard question, you know, the hard conversations that, that Gina talked about, which every leader knows eventually you're gonna have to have, um, it really does something for the other folks in the school. When they see you not only kind of helping people realize this might not be the place for them, but also having people who might not see themselves as leaders actually have that opportunity. So I think that that's great. That's great. Anybody else on that? Were you I would build off of what they said, uh, certainly after the vision and the climate and that culture in place. But I think number four, where you're um, raising the level of expectation, I think the most important thing we can do as principals is make sure that there's a a high quality teacher in every classroom mm -hmm. and so having those difficult conversations that Gina talked about helping support um, them getting better or helping them 
move on if needed. Uh, that's, that's the work we do. And, and Eddie, could you talk a little bit about when, when you talk about ensuring that there's a high quality teacher, um, could you just reflect a little bit on the decisions, the leadership actions that you've made, and, and others can feel free to jump mm -hmm. in as well, but the leadership actions you've made about which classes get which teachers, because I know oftentimes um, those building level decisions in and of mm -hmm. themselves are leadership actions, right? Sure. And, and the decision that a principal makes about which group of kids um, gets what teacher sure. um, can have that impact. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, something we've done is we made a conscious effort to, because in the past you've seen situations where you know the strong teachers get to teach the, the high kids, the gifted mm -hmm. kids, and uh, the new teachers get to teach the special needs kids. Um, we have mixed that up and have moved people around and we need, I need teachers that, that can teach students of, of any um, level of ability and, and challenges and, and to be effective uh, across different classrooms. So we, we've uh, kind of made some people uncomfortable with that, but it's been important and it's also been beneficial to, to all, the, all the students because they're getting taught like they're gifted, um, regardless of if they are or not. Um, and, and so we've changed that. Um, as far as from a leadership standpoint, figuring out what exactly you're looking for, it's part of our teacher evaluation system that we uh, look at specific standards and our expectations and look at what's consistently, what are we looking for with differentiation or rigor and those kind of things so that we're, we're on the same page. That's great, that's great. So now, you all get to turn the table a little bit and sitting here as, again, high-performing school leaders and thinking through um, those five elements that Wallace has identified, right, are characteristic of high-performing leaders. Now I want you to think about if you could give one piece of advice um, to district or state leaders um, in thinking about developing those capacities, what are the things, what are the obstacles that they could move out of your way to help make not only your jobs easier, um, but the jobs of new principals, people who might want to be high performing school leaders like yourselves, um, what, what could they do to remove some of those obstacles? And, and full disclosure, um, as a former district leader, um, I really am interested in this because not being in, in the field anymore, I don't get to hear and, and I feel like, oh, okay, there's something missing if I don't know what's getting in people's way. So this is, this is also now your opportunity to say, look, folks, if you really want us to continue to lead at high levels, it would be great for you to either address this or move this obstacle out of my way, my colleague's way, so that we really can have more leaders exemplifying um, these characteristics. We only had an hour, right? <laughs> um, you, you can pick your most salient one, but I, yes, that's fine. <laughs> I think one of the key elements is uh, the real, authentic um, experience in becoming a principal. Mm. Uh, Denver uh, this year has, um, not this year, but a, a few years now has principal residence. Um, and I believe it's through the Wallace work. And so I think uh, Denver for sure has um, um, gotten some of those obstacles out of the way, but I think, you know, um, being a principal or an administrator now for 11 years, I remember the days when someone would just go into a job and just struggle. Very talented individual, um, but struggle, and before you know it, a year or two, they're done. Yeah. And I think um, I, my advice would be not only to have those principal residents with high-performing principals, but at the same time, um, what's helped me a lot is to travel and get to know other pe people outside of Denver, outside of Colorado, mm -hmm. um, because you can always take a gold nugget back with you. It might not be um, uh, apples and apples, but something that they're doing, um, putting a system into place or a strategy into place that you've never thought of makes all the difference. So I think having um, um, the funding and the professional development to send um, talented folks out to different areas to see it experience it would be um, very beneficial. I would add one of the things that I'd like to see is um, more work with at the university level um, and bringing uh, and, and ensuring that we are preparing um, students to enter the field of education. 
um, and to get a realistic idea of what it is um, that we're facing on a regular basis. So I think building that relationship between the university and the partnership with um, districts will really improve the quality of what we see coming into our building. Um, because a lot of the time, some of the teachers that we do receive just happen to run into education as if it was not their first choice. So those who have made the decision to make education their first choice, if we could really work with the universities and in preparing them so that we do receive um, quality teachers on the onset in the beginning, um, and we will continue to work with them, but at least you have someone whose uh, mindset was, this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, th and that's a great point, Danielle, because I think a lot of times when you're in the moment as a school leader, you're so focused on where you have people when they arrive at your school. And this point that you bring up, which I think is really important, and that is what are we doing long before um, school leaders, teachers, um, get to the building. There, there's a lot of kind of policy discussions now about mm -hmm. that, um, and I'll make a plug for tomorrow. You know, we're going to have another webinar um, on Paul Mana's report. But I, I do think this piece that is very, um, very easy when your school leaders like you all here to just be so focused on I got to get folks now there. And I think you're raising a really important point about what are we doing long before they arrive to you all, so that you don't have to spend as much time doing catch up would, I think, is a great reminder of, of just how much we ask of you all to do, not just manage the people in your building, but also prepare them sometimes as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other? I'll, I would say to really, um, it seems like a lot of the work added on to teachers' plates come from people who have not been in a school ever or are so far removed on the responsibilities of teachers that they have no idea what they're asking. And people leave in droves, leave in education. And you know, effective principals really try to shield their teachers from a lot. But you know, in North Carolina, we have the whole response um, to intervention process. Well, now that's on a platform. And so it's not just teachers being concerned and coming up with interventions. Now it's on a, a platform-based module that takes hours upon hours. And if you're in a Title I school and you have students with lots of needs, then that's more time that that's going to take away. There's just lots of things that, and added things that really take away from teaching and learning that shouldn't be in their way. And I would say just working on the processes and the data and the managing of people, that needs to be fixed. That's a great point because we do. We sometimes um, continue, and you know, mea culpa. Um, there were times where I would get, I would get calls in the mm -hmm. CAO's office from principals saying, "Really, Sonia, this thing again, right? <laughs> or one more piece?" And you, you're right. You have to step back and say, "How are we hearing the voice of the people that we're charging to do the work?" And if we want high-performing leaders, we we have to give you the structures and the support to make those decisions without continuing to layer on to everything you've got to work through, which is a great point. Good. So um, also looking and seeing where we are. Um, one of, the, one of the, um, the pieces that I think would be also interesting to hear from you all is why you stay in the work where you are working. I am sure you all get numerous requests um, to go to schools, to go to communities in some ways that are already heavily resourced that would be so much easier um, to work in. And you don't, you're heavily sought after. I, I know that already, it's too bad because I'm not hiring principals now, but I would be heavily uh, recruiting you guys now. And, and so why do you stay when people say, look, you could, I could give you a job over here that's so much easier, I could get, in, you know, hopefully nobody walks off tomorrow. Um, but <laughs> But why do you stay where you are when it is clear that there are so many other um, things you could be doing, that people are probably coming after you all the time, but yet on a regular basis, it's clear you guys continue to stay. You do the work with some of our most underserved young people. Um, what gets you back up in the morning? Why do, why do you continue to do it? Well, I think for me, where the biggest thing is inspired 
Um, and you know, as much as we talk about inspiring um, other adults, teachers, and students, I think um, the power in working in this field is the, uh, op the other side of that, where mm -hmm. kids inspire us. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, working in a 612, in a um, hard to serve environment, um, the ups are really high, you know, and having shaking hands at graduation and knowing the story seven years ago is incredibly uh, rewarding and um, it fills my cup and it makes me want to do it all over again. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's it for me. That's great. Mm -hmm. that's great. For me, as a, as a first generation American, I'm sort of a beneficiary of, of the opportunities uh, that this country provides. So it's a chance to really uh, give back, I guess, and to, to show that appreciation. And I would say for me, it's pretty much the same thing. It's the students. You get immediate feedback. You, you see the labor of your work each and every day. Um, some professions don't get that opportunity. So each and every day you go into a building, it's different. Um, and things that you face are different and challenging. But you see the rewards immediately, um, whether it's the thank yous from the students, the parents, the hugs, the things that you get each and every day. Those are the things to me that um, motivates me to continue to go back. I'd say it's, as long as I have a positive impact in the job that I'm doing, then I want to do that. It makes a difference. And um, as long as it's rewarding, I'll continue to work. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's really interesting um, about uh, the four of you as I think exemplary of many other of your colleagues who are working at this day in and day out, um, just a couple of observations. Um, one, how incredibly reflective you all are. And I don't think people appreciate that in the day-to-day -day work of school leadership with everything from physical emergencies to district, you know, ridiculous requests, <laughs> um, and, and all the way to the core of the instruction, the fact that you all can be as intentional about your practice and reflective as you are um, really is, I mean, really is an encouraging and it's amazing. And I don't think we often acknowledge enough just how adaptive your work really is and just how continually you have to reflect on practice. Um, two, another observation second would be um, your commitment to high levels of achievement for all kids. There are a lot of people who say it, they put it on a placard or a poster. Um, or people dismiss it as something that's not possible. And in all that you, that you guys have described and shared today in all of your stories, what, one theme also runs clear, and that is you are committed to proving um, in word, deed, and student outcome what all young people are capable of. You have not taken the easy way out. You have the difficult conversations. You make the leadership actions that aren't going to be popular, you know, taking a teacher from um, a high performing class to one of a class of, of, of students that frankly we have undereducated, right, is that, 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 that can be a very political move. And so the fact that your commitment is one that is palpable and tangible um, is also really encouraging. And, and it links to a third piece, and that is you are not only passionate, but you are knowledgeable and you're courageous. And I think those three characteristics um, you don't often find um, in, in one individual. You know, I've, I have had principals over the course of my career who are incredibly passionate, and I know that they care about their kids, um, but the knowledge isn't there to actually move the work in the systematic and very deliberate ways that you all are doing. Likewise, there are people that are incredibly knowledgeable about the instructional core. Um, but when it comes to inspiring people, when it comes to bringing their passion to the forefront, um, they stumble. And sometimes they look behind them. And for all of their knowledge, there's no one following. Um, and you all are able to do that. And then I think third um, is this idea of courage, um, that you can be knowledgeable. You can even be passionate, but at the end of the day, when you have to have an uncomfortable conversation, when you have to be able to push back at your, your chief academic officer and say, no, that's not what's good for my school right now, and this is why, those are all things that take courage. And I think that, frankly, the biggest 
example of your courage overall is that it is not easy leading and advocating on a daily basis for young people who so many folks would say, I don't know why we're trying to get, why, why we're trying to get undocumented kids who clearly have um, so much going on in their lives graduating. And the fact that you do that, the fact that you do say no to people, that, that you bring your own stories and your own passion to the work, but it translates in courageous leadership actions, um, I, for me, is really the, the icing on the cake. Because there's a lot of passionate, knowledgeable people who, when the pressure is facing them, frankly, buckle and say, well, OK, no, I've got five parents in my office. And I'm, I'm going to leave that teacher where they are, <laughs> because if not, I'm going to get this blowback. And the fact that you stand on the line, you make those calls knowing um, that as the leader, you're exemplifying for all of the folks um, that, that you're leading. I, I just want to say, you know, at close to 5 o'clock um, on a Monday morning at the beginning of the week, um, that, that you all are to be um, truly applauded, commended. Um, I have, like I said, I've been in hundreds of schools, probably a thousand if I were to sit back and count, over the course of my career. And um, not everybody is you, but I think what is, what is truly telling in your work is you act, you interact, you support, and you build your teams in ways that you do believe that we can have so many more school leaders other than you. You don't approach this work. Um, you certainly are not prima donnas. Um, you certainly share your, your limelight and you empower others. And I just, I, I really want to thank you um, on behalf of not just, not just Wallace, not just, um, you know, the folks that, 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 are, that are here today, but really for the young people in the communities that you serve. Um, too often, the most needy communities um, suffer from not having the dedicated, committed, committed excellence of leadership. And you all, frankly, I think are making some people jealous who supposedly have cushier assignments um, in that uh, you really are showing what is possible. So I really do want to thank you um, for your work, for your commitment. I want to thank um, Wallace for sponsoring this. Um, Carol and the and the the folks the folks here um, at the National Association for Elementary um, and we have secondary principals that are represented here today um, and I, I I do you guys as somebody who works with policymakers all day many of whom um, have never been at a school or know nothing about running a school um, the fact that you all are doing the work is actually reinvigorating for me as well so I just want to say a big thank you. Um, for you, for all you do, and please continue to do it on behalf of kids. Thanks, so, Sonia. thank you very much. Great. And want to thank everybody for coming today and everybody who tuned in.